no real institution that permits human beings, in fact encourages human beings, to go beyond their cultural values, to burst through into some transcultural super space, forage around out there, and bring new means back into the tribe. To some degree, our, our artists do this. To some degree, our scientists do it. But it's all hit and miss. It's all willy-nilly. And once achieved, it must be swept under the rug in the service of the myth of method that somebody was following somebody else's work or somebody was applying a certain form of rational or logical analysis and that that led to their breakthrough. If, if you've read Thomas Kuhn's book on the structure of scientific revolution, you know, this is all lies and propaganda. The, the real story of science is that it's a series of revelations brilliantly defended by people whose careers depended on the brilliant defense of those revelations. One of the best kept secrets of the birth of modern science is that it was founded by an angel. That uh, the young René Descartes was whoring and soldiering his way across Europe as a 21-year-old in a Habsburg army, and one night in the town of Ulm in southern Germany, he had a dream. Strange that this would be the birthplace of Albert Einstein some 200 years later. Uh, but Descartes had a dream, and an angel appeared to him in the dream, and the angel said, the conquest of nature is achieved through measurement and number. And he said, I got it, modern science, I'll go do it. <laughs> and, and he did, he did. And that was the method for over 250 years of the conquest of nature. And it leads us, you know, to the Josephson Junction, the Mars Global Surveyor, long base interferometry that searches nearby stars for Earth-like planets. It brings us the entire cornucopia of scientific effects. And but an angelic revelation disguised as a logical philosophical breakthrough. This is what uh, you're not told in the academy. So my point there is human progress has always depended on the whispering of alien minds, confrontations with the other, probes into dimensions where imagination and chance held the ruling, uh, held the winning hands. So the shaman, as a paradigmatic figure, is applicable both in the aboriginal social context and in the present social context. Uh, the Skywalker, the one who goes between, the one who passes outside of the tribe and then returns with uh, means, insights, cures, designs, glossolalia, technologies, and re-fertilizes the human family by this means. It's irrational, but it's how it actually happens, and it's how it's always happened, and it may very well be the only way that it can happen. This cultivation of the irrational, this flirtation with the breakdown of boundaries. So now, in our nuts and bolts technological progress, we have somehow created technologies which are very friendly to our social values in that these technologies can be bought, sold, licensed, upgraded, uh, all things which we understand. But these technologies are acting on us in the same way that psychedelic drugs do, but more profoundly, more generally, and more insidiously because their effect is not understood, or if it is understood, it's not discussed. 
And so in a way, we have come into a kind of post-cultural phase. All culture is dissolving in the face of the drug-like nature of the future. Its music, its design, indeed the very people who will inhabit it appear to be the most switched on, the most chance-taking, the most alive of the, of the entire tribe. People who feel the beat, people who are not afraid to take chances, people for whom these technologies have uh, always been very natural. Machines are central to the new capitalism, the information transforming technologies. And in fact, one of the strange things that is happening is every move we now make in relationship to the new technologies redefines them at the very boundaries where their own developmental impetus would lead them toward a kind of independence. In other words, we, we talk about artificial intelligence. We talk about the possibility of an AI coming into existence, but we do not really understand to what, a de to what degree this is already true of our circumstance. In other words, how much of society is already homeostatically regulated by machines that are ultimately under human control, but practically speaking, are almost never meddled with. Uh, the world price of gold, the rate of petroleum extraction and other base natural resources, how much of these things is on the high seas and in the pipeline at any given moment, how much electricity is flowing into a given electrical grid at any moment, the distribution and the billing of that electricity, all manufacturing and inventory processes are under machine control. So in other words, the larger flows of energy, capital, and ideas already have a kind of autonomous life of their own that we encourage because it makes us money, it makes our lives smoother, uh, it empowers us. It's a symbiotic relationship of empowerment. Even in the matter of the design of these machines, once, you know, human engineers would work from a set of performance specs and they would design a chip to meet those specs and the architecture would be put in place by human engineers. Now a machine is told, here are the design specs, design the architecture to satisfy the specs, and when that is done, the chip is manufactured. The actual design of the thing is in the hands of machines. So these machines are, uh, you know, McLuhan once said of human beings, he said, we are the genitals of our technology. We exist only to improve next year's model. Well, appears that they're phasing us out of this ignominious role as well as every other role. Oh, let's see here. Uh, here, so being an optimist, that's where I was, yes. Uh, how to make gold out of this situation? In other words, how to see this as a natural and positive unfolding of the planetary adventure. And for some of these ideas, I'm indebted to, uh, to Michael DeLanda, who wrote a book called A Thousand Years of Linear His of Nonlinear History, and I, I highly recommend it. He didn't say what I'm about to say. I'll take credit and blame for it, but the book gave me the idea. When you stand off and look at human beings and their technologies, it's, uh, it's very hard not to notice that uh, from the very moment that we have a technology that can dis be distinguished from chimpanzees pushing grass stems down anthills or digging with sharpened bones or something like that, the minute you get past that, we 
Our technologies have always involved the materials of the earth. 